Good evening. Please join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome to the Hampton Board of Selectmen meeting July 16th. First thing we will have is public comment. Although it wasn't on the agenda, I will, if anybody from the public would like to speak, now is the time. Seeing none, announcements and community calendar. Mary Louise. Yes, um, I'm assuming that after our vote, on July 2nd related to the Experience Hampton um, request for the grant submission. Um, I am, Fred has updated all of us, I'm sure, on what happened and that the uh, Experience Hampton people were not able to raise the $1.5 million basically in cash that would be a requirement <coughs> for submitting that grant. Um, I think we need to take a second look at conflicts of interest on this board. Um, you were Mary on the Louise, this is for the announcements and community calendar. This is not... Okay, well then I'll, I'll get into it afterward. I have no, nothing under that. Jim. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I had left. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the lifeguards down at the beach did a tremendous job if you've read in the newspaper. Yeah that they did a nine rescues in one night, 13 yeah. rescues the next day. Mm -hmm. You know, people should realize that the ocean is dangerous, and when there's riptides, it's extremely dangerous, and they should, they should just pay attention to what they're doing and not put others' lives at risk that are out there yeah. uh, trying to rescue them. But I give kudos to the lifeguards down there and to the whole organization down there. They've done a great job, and I think the fire department was also involved in somewhat, and it's a great mm -hmm. job. And actually, it was noted that some of those lifeguards, when they did it, were actually off duty at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Jim, I mean, sorry, Rick. <laughs> um, no, I would just like to say I did take a ride down early this morning to ch check out uh, to see how everything looked at the beach, and uh, it looked very good, uh, considering how busy it's been, and I'm sure it's not easy, but it looks like a lot of people have been doing their job. Excellent. And I just want to thank the uh, you know, Channel 22 people. They've been working very hard on the studio here. As you've noticed, there's some more lights. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. We have a couple new monitors. They have some new cameras. Uh, but they are working very hard at, at trying to get it. So there, there may be a couple of hiccups still with it, but they are working through it. And uh, we appreciate all the work they've got done so far. All right, we have the approval of the minutes for July 2nd public session. Also move both uh, sets of minutes. Second. Okay, so we're going to move both sets. All those in favor? Unanimous. Consent agenda. We have a coin-operated amusement device. We have an entertainment license posted permit for the Victoria Inn. We have a parade gathering for the Hampton Beach Seafood Festival. We have seafood sidewalk sale vendors. We have the uh, Seabrook and Hampton Estuary Alliance. Approval of a grant. Also move the consent I am agenda. Gonna, oh, I'm going to move that, and I and I and I. You want a second? Yeah. All right, and I totally agree with you, but I, uh, at, for the listing, I will abstain from the um, public and gathering license part of this. Oh, so, okay. All those in favor? Unanimous. And just have it noted that I abstained on the uh, yes, number sir. three. <laughs> Appointments. Ellen Lavin. 2018 TAN signing. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Good. I was here, as you remember, about a month ago to get yep. permission to borrow four million dollars in a tax anticipation note, and we were supposed to come back probably about a month ago. And we couldn't sign the original note with the original interest rate that I told you because there was an anticipation that the sewer was going to be uh, come in at bid at more than $5 million, And we had already borrowed $1.1 to finish up town. 
and adding the four to that would have brought us over $10 million. So therefore, the notes are no longer tax exempt, which means the interest that we pay to Provident, they have to pay tax on. So the interest rate is fixed, and it has gone to 2.5%. So, and I, and according to Christy, I guess the bids came in less than five, but when uh, Bond Council went over all of the borrowings that we were doing this year, we were going to be over the max to make the tax anticipation note tax exempt. So you have the new one that we can sign? I now. have the new one that you can sign. Any I questions for it? You, you would get bored if you didn't have a challenge occasionally. That's right. Actually, it's never happened. <laughs> but just one more time, just to explain what, it, what a TAN is. A tax anticipation note? Yeah, just so people that are watching, yeah. in case somebody doesn't know exactly what it is. I know everyone has already paid their taxes for July, but between now and the, uh, and the 1st of December, or, or when the second bill goes out, we may need to borrow money in order to cover expenses. Uh, in the last few years, I have not borrowed, but we just like to obviously know that we have at least $4 million in case we have to pay expenses. And what did you say the uh, previous interest was? It was like 0.79%. And now it's fixed. Well, I shouldn't say that. It will be fixed, but they're not going to determine the rate until three days before closing. Uh -huh. So the date on this note is the 20th, which is next Monday. So three days before would actually be Wednesday. And they quoted me, Provident quoted me in the commitment letter of 2.5%. Hmm. So. so we need a motion to... I also move, Mr. Chairman, to approve the 2018 tax anticipation note signing. Thank you. Second? I'll second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Thank you for all the good work you do. Thank you. Quite a few pieces. Yeah. Are we passing please. these around? Or? Yes, please. Uh, uh, so I signed both and moved yes, them on. Please. Okay, we can do that. This is a note. That's the note. Just one more coming. Mm -hmm. reports for 2018 it's the sixth month and the target is 50 percent you all should have received them in your mailbox and your email and they are on the town website uh, when you review the attached revenue report you can see the differences in revenue from 17 and 18 the 2018 revenue is greater than 2017 by one hundred seventeen thousand and ninety one dollars the counts making up this increase include the motor vehicles building permits legal review, parking lots, district court fine, and the real estate trust. So those are like the larger accounts of, um, 
are greater than what they were in June of 17. The month's total income was $750,144. Of that total, total, motor vehicles came in at $326,594. Interest on taxes at $9,734. Payments in lieu of taxes, $120,000. <coughs> Building permits at $28,354. <coughs> Departmental income at $139,123. Parking lot revenue at 69976 and the real estate trust at $48,541. On the expense side, you'll find that we are 46.86% spent or under budget by $776,627 or 3.14%. In June of 17, we were under budget by 987905 or 4 4%. Now the summer season is underway, you will see this gap close. This month I will point out where all the major sections of the budget are at. Executive section, which has the town manager, board of selectmen, budget committee, uh, and some other small departments, is at 49.8%. Election registration and vital statistics, this is where the town clerk is, is at 43.63%. Financial administration is at 44.5%. That includes the tax collector assessing MIS and finance. Legal is at 52.32%. Personnel administration is at 40, I mean at 50.48%. Planning is at 50.77%. General government buildings is at 47.9%. Cemetery is at 55.6%. Municipal insurance is at 37.05%. I'll just point out there that's uh, significant, er, under budget by quite a bit, but we have the workers' comp and um, property liability payments coming up because they're semi-annual. So. Other general government parking lots is at 51.59%. The police department is at 44.5%. Fire department is at 46.2%. The building department is at 41.27%. <coughs> Emergency management is at 77%. Other services, which is the hydrants, is at 51.97%. Street lighting is at 48.3%. And public works is at 52.6%. However, I did note there that if you don't include two large purse stores, they have about one for the temporary force main and the other one for their chemicals. They are only running at 47.3%. Animal control is at 45.19%. Mosquito control is at 32.57%. Welfare is at 41.13%. Parks and Recreation is at 46.82%. Library is at 51.65%. Conservation is at 45.95%. The other funds other than the general fund, Fund 24, the recreation has a balance of $234,519, which includes beach sticker donations of $12,118, and $18,770 being awarded in scholarships so far this year. Fund 25, the Cable Committee has a balance of $356,961. We've only paid for half of the studio, so that balance will be dropping significantly once the work is completed. Uh, Fund 26, the Private Detail has a balance of $162,711. Uh, Fund 27 EMS has a balance of 436275 and the wastewater system development charge. Uh, the fees collected in 2018 totaled $23,541 with a balance in the account of 220404 and the board has outstanding approved projects totaling 117676 So when you adjust the balance, there's about $102,728 available. Um, in that fund. And that is it. Alrighty. Jim, you have any questions? No, no, it's a good report. Things look like they're in order. Yeah. Wait, on the line items, when you're looking at the line items, there are some that are like 110%, 100 and those are all accounted for, right? And yes. That's because I go through each month and look at all of them. A lot of those you find in like the repairs and maintenance and for the computer supports and stuff because of the fact that we do um, annual licensing and stuff like that, or uh, for the finance, 
in our repairs and maintenance, you have a large chunk mm -hmm. of that goes towards our software support. So right. you see a lot of those things. Right. So, but yeah, we you're, go through you're and look on at those. Top of yeah. that, right? I yeah. look at all of those. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. So, um, what? How? In regards to previous years, how is the parking revenue? Parking revenue is. Uh, let's see here before I speak. I know for the 4th of July week, we were above what we were for the 4th of July week last year. But I think in June, we were closer in line. Um, we were about, at the end of June, we were running about 3,000 higher than what we were in 17. However, when I looked at July 4th, there was a significant, I can't remember the number right now because I haven't um, finished the finances for July yet. But I did look at that in the 4th of July week was significantly higher than the 4th of July week last year. So it's all weather. You know, we didn't really have that great of a June weather-wise. Um, but we're starting to track in our office. We went back through all of the parking lot slips from last year and track the weather. And then this year we're going to track the weather so we can kind of compare better apples to apples. Because um, if you have a great summer or a great spring, Obviously, you're going to take in more money than a spring that's kind of wet like we had this year. It was not too warm. So, Thank you for your report. You're welcome. Hey, Louise. Yes, thank you, Christy. Um, one thing that I continue to uh, be happy to see is the wastewater system development charge. We put that in uh, several years back, and that's for new uh, development, new bathrooms over and above what may be in existing properties. And uh, this has, uh, thank you for keeping that running total, $402,220. Yes. And that money is used strictly by public works. We don't have to raise it in taxes. And uh, I really appreciate uh, you keeping track of that. As always, you do a great job. You keep us well informed and you keep a good eye on all the town's uh, thank you. The money. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next one we have Steve Falzone, trustee of the trust fund, second quarter report. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening Steve. Steve. How are you? Thanks for meeting with me. Uh, Q2, I mean, markets continue to be choppy. Uh, the fund continues to perform okay. I mean, it was a positive return again this quarter, uh, lagging a little bit of its benchmark, but still not bad. Uh, the international markets and the equity markets continue to be a drag on all the portfolio, on, on, on the portfolio as well. Uh, meeting with Steve Stokes today from uh, Bearing Point, uh, we discussed making a potential few changes to some of the portfolios. Uh, and in the projection report, it still shows that the portfolio should return somewhere north of $800,000 to the town this year. So, I mean, the portfolio is, as John said the last time we were here, pretty boring. And it's structured to be that way to return income to the town. And that's what it's structured to do, and that's what it does. So, I don't have too much more than that. I mean, it's consistently been good news, you know, a good performer for the town. Mary Louise? And some of the risky areas, Steve, like people are talking about oil fluctuating and who's got enough oil and overpricing yeah. oil and all that business. Do we have much exposure? I don't in, believe we do in those. In those high-risk stocks. No, it's Good. The, the uh, investment policies don't allow us to invest in anything yeah. that risky. So, I know you've always been conservative. Yeah, no, it, it, it is a conservative, very mm -hmm. conservative portfolio. You gentlemen have done a great job Thank you. over the years. Thank you. Gentlemen and ladies. Yes, we now have a yes. oh, woman Brett? on the board. Rick? No, thank you. Thank you. Jim? Market's choppy. Yeah, they just, I mean, they it's they had just, a good run, right? Yeah, now. we had a fantastic run. I yeah. Mean, whether it's the town's money or even my own money. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it was fun ride for quite a while. Now you just right. sort of. Tighten up the seatbelt. And you're invested in the long term. Oh, yeah. Bill, as Bill Hartley always said, it's 100-year money, so it's yeah. not going anywhere. Yeah. You know, but we, we constantly stay in touch with Dave and Steve from Bering. And, you know, if it needs to be tweaked a little bit, we'll, we'll do just that. So any way to lower costs of the 
portfolio is what we're trying to do right now, so yeah. good, a better return. Thank you for what you do. The new board member working out well? <laughs> yeah, uh, Dave, Dave Hamilton settled in, had a nice participation in the meeting today, and John and uh, Nancy <clears throat> are on board. I mean, with Nancy being a financial advisor, she and she and John think very much alike. And uh, it's good. It's, it, it keeps. I think it keeps Dave and Steve on their toes. Okay. Excellent. Super. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Next one we have Renee Boudreaux, Director of Parks and Recs, for his departmental update. I believe this is his first. <laughs> No, was second. Once second, the first was yeah. so uh, the first unforgettable. Was exactly. <laughs> two and a half weeks, I think. Yeah, two and a half weeks into it. Yeah. Right. So, um, being a little more acclimated to the position, um, for summer right now, we're four weeks into our summer program. Our Tuck program is our big summer camp that we run. Uh, we have 65 kids. It runs Monday through Friday. That's our big summer camp program. Um, as far as programs go, that's our biggest, most consistent program. Um, we also have a couple of programs that still have space available. Um, and what I'm doing is telling everybody to go to the website, hamptonrec.org. I won't sit here and try to hold every program out. Um, there is one, it's a space camp, August 20th. I do want to announce, because we do have some openings in that that I think would be really exciting for kids. It's just one that hasn't got the exposure yet that I think it could. Um, as far as some of our special events, we just held a strawberry festival for the senior citizens of Hampton along with the firefighters. Um, the rec department really has the easy job. We sell the tickets and hand them out to everybody while the firefighters donate their time, go get the product, and Tracy at the Victoria Inn helps us out and lets us use their venue for the day. Um, we get a lot of seniors that we would usually not see at our other programs, um, so it's kind of good. We had 115 of them. Wow attend on that day so great turnout um we're looking to maybe mix it up a little bit we're not quite sure how to do that it used to run at the fire department i think back in the day maybe when rusty was there i don't recall i know we did it there a few times but um as far as other stuff going forward we've been meeting with the library a lot um looking to collaborate they run a bunch of programs we run a bunch of programs and we haven't been really connecting the dots there, so we're working with Amanda and Stacy over at the library to cross promote each other's programs. Also, um, they've been interested in using the bus for some of their programs during the day for the older people that are at the Dearborn and Atlantic yeah. Heights and stuff like that. So we're trying to work out a way if our programs aren't running that day and using the bus where they would be able to access that. Um, other than that, we're pretty much rolling we have four weeks left to camp we have flag football coming up which is a big one for us um usually 250 kids or so we had one minor setback in late may maybe we had a water leak in the tuck parking lot yeah. which um wasn't really accounted for but we got it fixed and we'll go from there and move on and hopefully not have any more surprises as far as stuff like that goes so we're looking um also i forgot to mention we just got our new office operations person in. Um, she's three weeks in and we're excited. Uh, she's very experienced, got lots of great ideas, and in three weeks we've already had a bunch of different comments from the community saying that they like what she's doing, so. Questions? Rick, any questions? No, thank you. Mary Louise? Did they make you pick the strawberries? I had nothing to do with the strawberries. <laughs> Jim. Yeah, good job. I stop in the recreation office periodically, and they're always busy in there. They're always doing something. You have a new intern, too, right? Yes, Duncan from UNH, yes. Okay, yeah. working well. Yep. Uh, and you had a new worker at the park? Yes, we lost uh, a nine-year yep. parks guy, and we brought in a new, um, a new young lady named Nikki who's working out very well. She's two or three weeks in, um, taking up some of the slack. She's got some energy. She's working hard. Good. Everything so, looks good. It looks like you got the programs rolling really well. It's been a good transition between you and Diana because mm -hmm. you worked so well together before. So good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Amanda's hard to resist, yeah. so it's nice to see you in the library getting together. She's no, it's so enthusiastic. Well, that's great. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. Yeah. Next one we have is Chief Sawyer. Good evening. 
Good Chief. How are you? Great. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you would indulge me, I did want to bring up a couple other items uh, besides what's on the agenda, just informational pieces. Um, I want to talk quickly about we're experiencing a lot of calls for service within the police department to deal with folks um, that are in need of care, uh, adults that are in need of care. And I think sometimes some of these folks get kind of lost in the cracks of society that we don't deal with them that well. Um, I'm talking about folks that have mental illness issues, folks that are battling addiction, uh, and elder. Uh, some of these folks wind up in situations where they don't have anybody in their immediate presence to turn to. And we want to let people know out there there are resources between the police department and the fire department. If you pick up the phone and call and ask for a well-being check for a family member or loved one, um, somebody's going to go out and knock on the door and find out what's going on with that person to see if they are somebody that is in need of services. And if you wouldn't mind, I just want to read. Um, the state of New Hampshire, we actually have, uh, under the Public Safety and Welfare chapter of our, of our laws, Chapter 161-F, <clears throat> Elderly and Adult Services, Reports of Adult Abuse Investigations, Any Person Including But Not Limited to Physicians, Other he Healthcare Professionals, Social Workers, Clergy, Law Enforcement Officials Suspecting or Believing in Good Faith that Any Adult Who Is or Who Is Suspected to Be Vulnerable Has Been Subject to Abuse, Neglect, Self-Neglect, or Exploitation, or Is Living in Hazardous Conditions shall report or cause a report to be made as follows. And the, and the statute goes on, but I just wanted people to know there are laws out there, there are services out there. I think part of the problem is somebody being the, playing the role of a gatekeeper to get people these services. And we, and we struggle with that in this town, too. So I just wanted the public to know, if you know of somebody that's in need of services, please do not hesitate to pick up the phone and call the police department, call the fire department. We're prepared to go out and take a look and just check on that person that you're in, you're, you have some concern over and try to get them, if, if they need it, to the right services. We're not always the, the service, but we can be a gatekeeper for them. So I just want to point that out because we are seeing an increase that in Hampton and we are seeing it throughout the region. Uh, the second item I want to talk to you about is on uh, Saturday, July 28th, around 1.30. There's a major motorcycle ride uh, sponsored by Seacoast Highway Davidson up in North Hampton. Now, what does that have to do with the town of Hampton? Yeah. Well, it's so big that it backs traffic up both directions, and Seacoast Highway is right there at the town line. So I just wanted to let people know uh, we're expecting somewhere in the vicinity of 460 motorcycles participating in this charity ride to come Post Road in North Hampton down and briefly cross the town line uh, on Post Road and then turn north on Route 1. It does cause a backup of traffic. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is monitoring that, if we see the backup, we're simply going to run a, uh, we've uh, worked with the Northampton Police Department. If we can see the backup and that many bicycles actually show up the day of the event, we're simply going to reroute traffic as a detour around mm -hmm. down Watson's Lane, up Mill Road, and back onto Cedar Road, Northampton, around the event so people can get to where they're going and not sitting there and waiting in traffic. We just want to make sure people knew about it. It's not an event in Hampton, but it has a traffic impact in Hampton, so we want to make sure we got that out there. Um, issue I came in to talk to you tonight, um, as you recall in the past, we usually budget for three cruises each year. Uh, we've, we've found that using the three cruiser method, mm -hmm. we change those out and we really reduce our maintenance budget and, and we have strong, safe vehicles for our officers to respond to. One of the things I'm looking for is we have a number of projects ongoing uh, in the police department is permission to instead of purchasing one of the uh, purchasing one of the vehicles out of Fund 26, which is the detail account, as opposed to the budget, uh, this would free up anywhere from 26 to approximately 28 thousand dollars for some of these projects we're try trying to complete, which includes some of our uh, road safety measures and also the uh, fencing that we're looking at for the uh, remediation of the firing range. Any questions? Mary Louise. Thank you for the information on uh, older individuals uh, who may need help. Are you passing out earplugs for the motorcycle stuff? <laughs> uh, if I happen to be standing by the side of the road, I know I'll be wearing them. I mean, the bikes are beautiful, but they are very loud. And when you get over 400 of them going by you, it's it's quite an impressive sight. It's a, it's a great benefit, but if you're standing there working, you probably ought to have some ear protection. Now, when I was out earlier today and on my way uh, here tonight, I noticed there was a cruiser on the high street 
And when I came back on and looked, there are signs up there saying no left turn. When you're westbound on High Street mm -hmm. to turn down, I, I don't know where those came from. It's, it's on Mill Road. And, and they're new signs, and I don't know. I'd have to go out and look, ma'am. I'm up where, where on Mill Road? Here. Right at the High Street Mill Road intersection. In the whites? Uh, well, it just says no left light. I come from, I come westbound from Little River on High Street, and on the sign on the the Mill Road, uh, approaching Mill Road. If I I usually turn left. Okay. To go down there, there's a big sign that says no left turn mm -hmm. and then if I look on the other side going north as I'm sitting on high street has the same sign there well there are signs it's one of those intersections in town where we you know in the state of New Hampshire we have right on red unless it's posted no right on red yeah. we have no right on red in that intersection but let me let me look up and take a look and let me get yeah. back to that because I'm not familiar puzzled. with the signs you're talking about so I'll yeah. when I leave here I'll take on my way home I'll take a ride up and check the intersection because I never seen anything like that at yeah, that I'm intersection not, before. No, we're not familiar with it. But so. there was a police escort out there, you know, directing traffic while they were, they saw the men putting the signs up. Okay, I'll take a look at it. Thank you, I appreciate that. No problem. Chief. And I have no problem with you using the, um, your... Chief, can you just... Thank you. Just uh, let us know, Fund 26, where does that money come from? Fund 26 it was established so that when the town uh, offered uh, somebody requested police services in the way of a paid police detail. There's a manner to pay the police officers, and it's a revolving account. So the officer will work whatever the detail is, the town will pay them, and then send a bill to um, the vendor that requested the service with an additional uh, fee of 50% of whatever the officer made uh, to pay for all the insurances and retirement costs, plus a little bit more. And that builds up into that fund, and we're permitted by. Uh, Town or, uh, when that was passed as a town ordinance and created it to utilize those funds for things that are relevant to providing officers or equipment uh, for uh, details for police or fire. I just, in case people didn't realize where yeah. it came from. Rick? Um, so we've done that before. We did it a couple of years. If you remember, yeah, we uh, we wanted to buy the fence to try to uh, keep the pedestrians out of Ocean Boulevard, yeah. and that's exactly how we did that. So I'll make the motion. I'll yeah, second. Like allowing to take money out of there to purchase it with additional crews that he needs. Here. Right. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. I'll motion. second it. Second. All those in favor? Yes. That's all. By the way, I had a lady uh, call my house today, commenting on the fencing, and she said, "If you could buy more, put it up." <laughs> We'll be coming back to you in the fall. Uh, just so you know, we do get uh, probably about eight to ten pieces of that dinged up every year. The way I look at that, it's a pedestrian that didn't get hit. Um, and I will be looking. Re Some of them, we uh, we bring them to public works, and they bend them straight for us the best they can. But when they get kind of unsightly, we, we, we get rid of them. Uh, so I'll probably be coming back with a request if there's funds available after the summer to, to replenish our stock. They are definitely a great deterrent. Yeah. To keep I would just like to ask, um, so has there been, um, I know that uh, during the 4th of July there was some pr um, problems in some of the local establishments. Has there been any more uh, unruly behavior being exhibited? We had, during the week of the 4th, we did have an altercation in the establishment along Ocean Boulevard. We had one on Ashworth Ave prior to that, but it, it's kind of... You talk to a lot of the local business people and haven't grown up down there. We, we call it the 4th of July light switch. From Memorial Day to the 4th of July, we're always a little on edge, and that's why we started that program with bringing the officers in, because some of the behavior is just its a mixture of college kids, high school kids, and just the summer hasn't really kicked off yet. Mm -hmm. And people just have that frustration of being cooped up all winter or whatever it might be. <laughs> but after the 4th of July, it just seems to, uh, it mellows right out. And I'm not saying we couldn't have a flare-up. We could. Mm -hmm. But I just, I think we have a better handle on it. Our people are out there working. They're trained. And I think the crowd dynamic changes substantially after the 4th of July. And I think if you talk to a lot of the, the hotel owners and restaurant owners down at the beach, they, mm -hmm. I think they would concur with what I'm saying. So you haven't had to uh, schedule more police or anything like that? No, I, one of my things I always look at, if we have an, a, a pattern of violence occurring in a licensed liquor establishment, 
I will order police officers in at their expense uh, under our laws. The chief of police has the right to do that, and they have to pay the bill or it's grounds to remove any, any permits from the town. And anybody that refused to pay, I would certainly write a letter to the liquor commission and have their liquor license removed. Um, it's very rare we've had to do that. Um, so far, we haven't, each of those establishments, it was a single incident. We haven't had a repeat at this point, so I'm kind of monitoring it. The owners know I'm monitoring it. And if we have future problems, and then they can expect to have two officers at their door during the busy peak times. Okay, great. I think that's uh, wise to... Mm -hmm. Seems to call the problem pretty quick when they have to pay for two officers on a Friday and Saturday night. Kind of okay. stops the problem real quick. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think you've done an excellent job up to now, Chief. I think uh, looking at the speech and, and seeing what's been going on, your you, you senior staff and, and the staff you brought, your, your regular staff and the staff you brought in from outside departments have... Uh, worked very well down there and I, I commend you and your men for, for having us such a great yeah. summer so far. So far. Well. Appreciate <laughs> that, but we're getting ready for Seafood Festival already. All right. We're already having our meetings. All right. Thank, well, thank, you. thank you very much. Next one is Henry Fuller yeah. and I was told Henry, he's not going to be here. No, he was at the meeting this morning and he said that uh, he has said what he had to say. So, All he's, right. so the next one we have is Aquarium Water with a quarterly update. We don't have the stand to put. Does it matter which side you're on? Because you're running that. Yeah, our planning board will need to get the stand to, too. All you need to do is plug into the HDMI. So this. We need to check okay. with the and then crew. Put it right into the HDMI. Yeah, it's gone someplace. See where the stand went. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> we'll find out, won't yeah, we? Yeah. <laughs> when you blow it down. We're not going to be able to see this, are we? Yes. Well, we should yes, be able to. Yeah. Yes. Center one. He's just plugging in now. Oh, that one. Oh, that one. Oh, my goodness. All this technology. So. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. Ugh, oh. I can type in my password correctly. We won't look. <laughs> just password123. <one>, <laughs> Excellent. And we are. Um, Good evening, all, and uh, I thank you, Chairman Bridle, and the rest of the members of the, of the board for having us in, the, in this evening. Uh, we appreciate uh, the continued collaborative relationship and open communications between uh, Aquarion and the board, and also with the staff members in town. Uh, open communications help us to understand the interest, needs, and the priorities of the community. Um, and they also help us to understand where you all think we're doing well and uh, where we could improve. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Selectman Regina Barnes. I know she's not here, but for her interest in, in water topics and for her role as the liaison uh, between the board and Aquarion. Uh, with me here this evening is, of course, Carl McMorin, who you all know, our manager for our New Hampshire operations, uh, and also Dan Lawrence, who'll be speaking uh, in a little while, he's our Director of Engineering and Planning. And John Hurley, uh, who you've seen also here before, uh, he's our Vice President of Water Quality and Environmental Management. Uh, so Carl is going to be speaking about uh, the testing on Well 22. Dan Lawrence will be speaking about, uh, excuse me, Carl's also going to be speaking about a main replacement that we've just completed on Mill Road. Dan Lawrence is going to be speaking about our water treatment, our centralized chemical um, water treatment system at Mill Road. And uh, John, is, John Hurley is going to be talking about uh, the PFAS issue. So with that, I will hand it over to Carl. Okay, we've been uh, performing the pumping test on uh, Well 22 since June 20th. Uh, we started at 650 gallons per minute. Uh, but then up to, to about 840 gallons per minute after a couple of days, and we've been pretty close to that level for, for the uh, subsequent time. Um, we're monitoring 20 private wells, uh, some close, some, some rather far away for both the water levels and the water quality. 
and only 10 of those wells have shown any kind of change in water level due to the pumping, and none of them have been adverse. Uh, you're probably aware that the water is being treated in a frozen distribution system where it helps meet a lot of the seasonal demand that we're experiencing. In fact, it's contributed almost a third of the water production uh, or met the demand uh, since June 20th, and uh, that's allowed us to significantly reduce already the limited use of well six, uh, in this case by about two thirds. And the uh, diagram or the picture you see there is what that pipe looks like coming up out of the wellhead. It uh, goes out across the yard into the existing uh, pump house for well seven and then on a, into the distribution system. Water quality has been very, very good. It's clear, no, no odor, no uh, discoloration. It's actually pretty soft, actually very soft, softer than most of our other wells. So it has a lower mineral content, uh, which is good for cleaning things. It takes less soap, leaves less spots on glassware and things like that. Um, we haven't detected any uh, VOCs yet, at least attributed to the wells, and we're seeing lower PFAS levels than we have in our other wells. That's what these bars show. So. Very low levels, actually lower than our other bedrock wells, lower than the average we see in all of our wells together, and considerably lower than the current health advisory level. Uh, so as it stands now, we're going to uh, end the pumping test tomorrow. Uh, we've got a good window with some wet weather coming in, so we can uh, turn it off and uh, also keep well seven off. Um, it'll be about six to eight weeks to put our final application together. Uh, for the final permit, there will be a public hearing involved in there at some point. Uh, but we expect to get a final permit by the end of the year. And um, then we proceed with uh, installing a permanent pump, the permanent piping. We're going to have to do some upgrades to the, uh, the power there to be able to drive two built large pumps and uh, also upgrade our chemical uh, treatment uh, systems. And then just one slide on the Mill Road main replacement, which is in progress. Uh, it involves replacing 4,200 feet mm -hmm. of old cast iron main on Mill Road over Northampton, uh, which uh, has had a high frequency of breaks. We started on June 11th. As of uh, last Friday, uh, we had a little over 3,700 feet done, and actually today they completed the rest of it. So it's all, all hooked up. Um, the first 1,800 feet are actually in service, and our contractor is moving uh, service lines over this week. Uh, the latter section will go through its final test this week, hopefully, and uh, then we'll proceed with uh, moving all the remaining service lines over. So I think at this point, a mid-August completion date looks pretty favorable. Uh, we may even come in earlier than that. And um, the total project cost at this point is projected a little over $1.2 million. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Sit, sit somewhere here, and I'll jump out of my way. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Again, I'm Dan Lawrence. Good seeing you all. So um, our Mill Road water treatment facility, that's the centralized chemical treatment that we've been working on. Um, that's where we're taking the... Uh, presently, we treat at well 9, we treat at well 11, we treat at well 6, and then we treat um, at 8A um, and a couple others. And combining those so we don't need to upgrade all of those facilities, but only have one new facility. So that's been um, <laughs> up and down. We've uh, completed all the piping associated with that. Um, you know, as most of you know, it's been challenged. Uh, the, the zoning decision was challenged, so um, we just got a ruling in the courts, um, as you can see on the bottom, and um, July 6th, and there's a 30-day wait period. Um, I did read the article in the paper, but uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, the new facility does provide us, uh, as you can see, operational effectiveness. Um, it helps with chemical storage, and it reduces maintenance requirements. Um, as part of the project, we also um, kind of did another project right out in front of the facil um, our facility and, re and replaced about 900 feet of 16, installed 900 feet of 16-inch water main to help convey that water um, back through the system. Um, so. We have a lot of improvements going on Mill Road. Uh, one of my uh, analysts was yelling at me because every project was named Mill Road. Um, and so we had to like, internally have a couple nicknames to make that work. But uh, it's going well. We're hopeful that um, the appeal process will uh, terminate from July 6th. But um, if it doesn't, we'll continue on. It's a very important project um, for us and the water system. So, oops. Let me just, sorry, Carl. Let's see. There we go. Um, 
Another piece, piece of the whole project we've been working on is the consolidation in piping for well 9, 11, and 6 in order to effectively create one point of entry for wells 9, 11, 6, 8A, 21, and 20. Mm -hmm. The um, orange square there represents the, um, the new chemical treatment facility, and that yellow line represents the direction of the flow out to the distribution system onto Mill Road. Um, it's an important thing, and, and so we've completed the installation for the most part. Uh, 9, 11, and 6 have all been in, are connected. Um, so all that water is coming together um, and coming out in one point of entry at this time. So that's a really good, good progress. Um, we did work through that. Uh, a couple odds and ends to finish up on that project, some restoration, but um, they did that as well. So we're, we're happy and pleased with that in eliminating um, some older facilities. Do you have a question on this? Yeah, a quick question. Sure. That blue line is the new pipe? Yes. Approximately, yes. And I believe when we were speaking with you this morning that you said you left the old ductile iron pipe in place rather than go digging it up all over and whatever. You you just put the new line in and the old line is just discontinued? So the um, lines that used to um, go from, if you look at well 9, well 9 out to Mill Road, and well 11 to Alton Mill Road, and well 6 out to Mill Road. Actually, they're still in service right now, in right. case you have an issue until we get everything done, but the intention is to abandon them. Yeah, you won't be digging it up to remove it, you'll just abandon it in place. That is not our intention, in place. yes. Excellent, okay. Any other questions on this from anybody? <clears throat> so I'm gonna let John Hurley he have the fun here, and then I'll be back to talk about the bench scale testing. Good evening. Hi, John. Uh, so we have uh, continued with our uh, monitoring for PFAS. We uh, collected samples in May and June. Those results are in. We've also collected the July set. Those result, those samples are at the lab. Uh, and the monitoring results show that the PFAS levels have been uh, consistent and remain uh, low. How do I advance this with this? Page down. Page down. There we go. Okay, so this is the chart that you've seen yeah. before. Uh, the current EPA in New Hampshire uh, standard at 70 for PFOA plus PFOS. Further down, we have Vermont's action level for PFOA only at 20, and New Jersey's proposed MCL for PFOA only at 14. And so our results remain uh, below uh, those standards, okay? And when we look at the total of all the PFAS compounds, uh, these are our six distribution points that where we're tracking it. And these uh, levels remain well below uh, the level of 70. As you may be aware, there's been a lot of discussion uh, recently amongst the uh, federal and state health agencies about revising the current action levels, the current limits on PFAS lower. So EPA has announced that they are going to uh, take a look at uh, establishing MCLs for four PFAS compounds. Right now they have action levels for two, PFO and PFAS. They're gonna look at uh, MCLs for four uh, New Hampshire now has legislation that's been signed by the governor where they have directed uh, DES to establish MCLs for the same four compounds that EPA is looking at. Chuck, did you explain what an MCL is? Okay, so an MCL is a, an enforceable standard, maximum contaminant level. So it's an enforceable standard where a water utility would be required uh, to meet that level. What's in place currently are action levels, where if you exceed that action level of 70, uh, you need to work <coughs> with your state, uh, and they would look at things like total exposure, not just the drinking water component, but the air, food, uh, inhalation exposure from your carpets and your, and your uh, furniture at home, yeah. that type of thing. Um, so looking to go to enforceable standards and you know, we'll see where the numbers come out. What Connecticut and Massachusetts have done is they've kept the, uh, they've adopted an action level of 70, but they've included five compounds instead of the two that EPA has. It includes those two, it includes the other two that New Hampshire and EPA are looking at, and a fifth uh, compound. 
And so what, what you see here on this slide with total PFAS is we have detected as many as eight compounds. So the total of all of those eight are well below that 70. That 70 is where, for example, New Jersey would come out if you add up their uh, 14 per PFOA plus their 13 per PFOS and their 13 for PFNA uh, and assume 14 or 13s for the remaining two compounds. So well below the current uh, limits and also well below uh, expected anticipated <laughs> limits. We anticipate the limits will come down. We believe we will be uh, lower than those limits as we are now. And we'll go page up. Okay, so um, uh, I've talked about the, uh, the second bullet here. Uh, I was in attendance along with Mark Gerald and Regina Barnes uh, at the uh, EPA regional community meeting in Exeter a couple of weeks back, and all three of us uh, uh, made uh, comments on the record to EPA about how they can uh, improve the way that they're uh, managing PFAS in drinking water. Uh, one thing that I want to point out is um, there were uh, a number of presentations made by community activist groups uh, from Bennington and Hoosick Falls, New York, and uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Westfield, Massachusetts, and these are all communities uh, that have experienced very, very high levels of contamination, so hundreds and even thousands of parts per trillion of PFO and PFOS, and they are very, very uh, concerned about uh, health effects from their drinking water, uh, including cancer, and they, they made excellent uh, presentations. And I think uh, the work that they've done and the work that uh, Mindy Mesmer has done has really uh, shown a light on the importance of this issue and is helping to get uh, EPA to act, but also Mark's comments and Regina's comments and mine, I think, uh, also uh, highlight uh, the need for e EPA to act in several areas. But the main point is the experience in Portsmouth and Hoosick Falls and Bennington and uh, Westfield, Mass., is not the experience here in Hampton. We are very much, much lower levels. There is PFAS being detected in the drinking water, but very low levels compared to these other communities uh, that I've just mentioned. Yeah. Um, moving on to the third bullet. Um, so when DES uh, issues their drinking water standards uh, by the end of this year, uh, then we'll be comparing our levels to those uh, standards. We expect that our, so we'll have a new line on our graph for, yeah. and we expect that we'll, we will uh, be below those. Um, so moving on to the groundwater pollution and abatement. So. Uh, DES uh, has announced that they have eliminated the discharge from the car wash. So the car wash has been discharging their wastewater to the ground with a permit from DES, uh, but that permit did not cover uh, PFAS. However, uh, in, in more recent sampling that the state has done, they determined that the car wash was actually exceeding uh, one of the parameter, one of the limits for a parameter in their existing discharge permit, and so has uh, shut down that discharge. Uh, so there's no longer that wastewater loaded with thousands of parts per trillion you know, PFAS going into the ground at that location. So that's good news. Also, mm -hmm. there's still plenty of PFAS left in the ground in the aquifer. Uh, but no more new PFAS going into the ground. That's a, that's a major step forward in uh, ultimate resolution of this issue. And then lastly, the uh, DH, DES private well study. Uh, here's a map that you've seen before. Uh, <coughs> approximately 75 samples have been collected. We don't have this fully updated. Uh, next time uh, we come, we will have it fully updated with all the results. But you can see uh, the green uh, color indicates less than part, 10 parts per trillion of total PFAS. All the mm -hmm. PFAS is being detected. So the great majority of the private wells and the monitor wells that are uh, indicated on this graph, on this map, uh, are less than 10 parts per trillion. 
Uh, the next level at yellow is less than 45 parts per trillion, between 10 and 45. And you can see that there are a few of those. Most of those are monitor wells. Or you see the red and the purple, those are known, known sources. So at the bottom, there's the Hampton landfill. In the center there in Northampton, that's the Mill Road uh, group, including our wells and uh, monitor wells from discharges that are permitted. And then up on the top is Coakley. Okay, but most of the private wells you can see are very, very low levels. There was one point in the center of Northampton there, an uh, auto repair place that does have a discharge that is uh, high level. But that's uh, really the only location where uh, significant levels of PFAS have been found. So there's two items of good news there. Most of your private wells have low levels of PFAS, no real high levels being consumed by the private well owners. And there is, there is not, other than Mill Road there, there is not a uh, significant source of PFAS that has been discovered in doing this monitoring of 75 points uh, in the area here between Coakley and our uh, Hampton, our uh, Mill Road wells. And that's it for monitoring. Any questions about the monitoring? Go ahead, Marilise. Yes, I do. I'm surprised on your map that it doesn't show more. Is, is each dot a single well? Because there, I think, are quite a number of uh, private wells in the northeast section of Hampton. I was just a little surprised to see. These are just, the ones that are tested, though, right? Just a few. Oh, those are just. Those are the, the ones we have test results back on. Uh huh. And for the people that actually responded and requested. Okay. And yeah. would you kindly explain what you told us earlier today? about if subsequent businesses like the car wash are found to be contaminating with whatever waste they have, what it, they may be uh, charged with some of the remedy or uh, you're going to have some kind of consequences if you find other businesses that are... Yeah, so, so like I mentioned, relative to the car wash, there's still plenty of uh, PFAS in the groundwater. And the next potential step is remediation. <clears throat> so the, the state w uh, would be involved uh, in that uh, DDS. So we'll be talking to them about what is the next step. Is there, do they have any plans for remediation of the contamination that's already in the ground? It's a great first step to eliminate continued discharge. No more discharge, mm -hmm. but do they uh, plan to do anything about the contamination that's already in the aquifer? Yeah. And the other comment I would make is that it's interesting that humans are the only animals on the planet who knowingly poison their habitat. Jim? Yeah. Uh, Carl, you jumped out real quick. Oops, I had a question for you, but you can sit there and answer it, I guess. <laughs> on Well 22, you said you've been testing and everything, but there were certain questions that people had about Well 22, weren't they? Whether it was going to reduce the level in other uh, wells, the sal salient the, with salt, Maybe you go up and answer those questions because people are interested in that, I believe. Carl, this is oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that one's active. Uh, yeah, salinity. And I appreciate you bringing that up because I did inadvertently skip over that. But we have been monitoring salinity mm -hmm. as part of the water quality. Yeah, the numbers have all been really low, like 0.3 when 300 is in the threshold for salt water intrusion. So again, that's part of the very good water quality results that we've developed. Uh, so far, and, um, and then weren't some people concerned that it would it would bring down the level in, in other wells in the area that you'd be drawing? Water? Right, and uh, as I indicated, yeah, you know, they have it there. Like uh, out of the twenty we're monitoring, we've seen some change in ten of them. None of them have been significant enough to mm -hmm. like threaten the pump level or anything uh, like that. But that's that's kind of data will be factored into the final permit. Uh, we may not get a full hundred, eight hundred and thirty to account for that, but we'll see what the data tells us and. You know, yeah. determine what a sustainable pump rate is. Okay, thank you, Carl. And I'd just like to say that Aquarian has been really cooperative with the town and really good on being proactive on all this and doing the testing. And I think I think it's been a good cooperation working with you guys. I think you've done a good job, and I think you did a good job going out and getting the private wells. And I think you paid for that, didn't you? The testing of private wells. Correct. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the New Hampshire did it, but you paid for it. Yeah, we yes, paid for the analytical right. results. Yeah. And when you said that. 
that you tested X amount of wells, that's the people that responded, right? More people could have responded. They had to give permission. Yeah. To access. Yeah. yeah. So D, uh, DES sent letters out to areas that we identified together mm -hmm. as concern, and it, you know, it's like you know, pick you put your hand around the system and say yeah. so. Um, and some people responded, and some didn't. Um, you know, we can't make people right. to test their wells, um, right. but and, it would be nice if more people responded. Mm -hmm. but. And, and John, when we're talking about PFAS, and some people might say, well, why are we talking about that now? Why weren't we talking about it five years ago? Can you answer that question? And that's, that's because it's just in the last, um, <clears throat> say, five years that the health he authorities have recognized that there could possibly be uh, health concerns relative to PFAS. So in 2013, EPA had the water utilities, uh, larger water utilities, uh, test for PFAS 2013 and 14. Uh, and we tested all of our, our wells, but we only had the one hit in well six. Uh, but then uh, Carl undertook to do uh, additional monitoring in 2000, starting in 2015 and 16 uh, with improved analytical methods, and that's when we found, okay, we do have this uh, present relatively low levels in most cases, not well six, but most of the rest of them. Uh, so, John, and so it's evolved from there. In terms of improved analytical methods, uh, more PFAS compounds at lower concentrations can now be detected in water supplies. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. And, and you started with four or, or less, and how many are you up to now? We started with six in the EPA study, and now we're testing for 26. So okay. just, just to be clear on that, so that means we're there were six compounds that the laboratories could test for. Yeah. They had the ability to test for six of them a couple of years ago. Yeah, EPA told the labs that we're going to do UCMR tests for these six. Yeah. After the study was done, the labs started developing the methods more and said, oh, we can see 12 compounds. Come and have us test them, and then 14, and then 26. So. Oh, my goodness. And are there, are there uh, notices going out to people that are using stuff that contributes to that, to stop? Doesn't Teflon... You know, notices going out to people, health notices saying, hey, guys, you should stop using your Teflon or you should switch mm -hmm. to a different product or... Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if that's the I mean, Aquarium's responsibility, but is somebody doing that? Well, I know that uh, EPA has worked with the manufacturers of Teflon and some of the other PFAS compounds to eliminate the use of PFOA and PFOS in mm -hmm. their products. That's in the USA. Other countries, China, other places are still using PFO and PFOS, but they have taken that step to get it out of commerce. Okay. Yeah. So what does it mean, Teflon? From the, the cooking on Teflon or? Yeah. Yes. So there's, it's a number of products that, are, that repel water, repel grease and oil and that type of thing. So Scotchgard, your, your stain resistant uh, 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 on carpet, your coating on carpets, uh, clothing, furniture, yeah. also Teflon, also firefighting yeah. foams. Yeah. That uh, that piece of paper that's inside your pizza box between the pizza and the bottom of the box, uh -huh. that's coated with uh, PFAS so that the oil doesn't go through to the bottom of the box and your pizza falls out the bottom. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, keep in mind, we can hear you. You have an extra microphone up here. You have a lot of people watching. We have taxpayers watching so they can hear you. Okay. All right. Oops. So the, the last thing we wanted to talk about, unless you have additional questions, is our bench scale testing. Uh, we provided you a copy of the bench scale testing report for PFAS treatment at Mill Road. Um, and so we want to keep, keep it quick here. It is a complex thing to do and a lot of technical data. So we just kind of try to narrow it down to two slides for everybody. Um, and as you can see, so we, we uh, evaluated granule activated carbon and ion exchange, the two most common technologies right now that are out there for removal of PFAS compounds. So um, in the end, um, both filters can remove most 
PFAS, the, with the, the carbon chains, it's not to get too complex here. You have longer um, carbon chains and shorter chain compounds. The shorter chains are harder to remove than the longer chains. Just keep that in mind. So PFO and PFAS are longer chains. And so we tested the different methodologies. Um, and really what you're looking for is when, do, when does a PFAS compound break through? Um, you know, does it break through after a certain period? Some break through at different levels. So, and the faster the breakthrough, that shortens the life of the media, which means you need to change the media out more often, which means it costs more to run that particular system. So what we were trying to understand is what the operating costs would be. I remember if we, the last time we were here talking about this, we had a range. Um, and interesting enough, we had uh, some interesting results, but um, if I go into the next page, Oops, not that way, the other way. Um, this is a very simple summary versus what's in the report, but hopefully this makes some sense to you. Um, so there's a couple options. One is source selection, which is really where we are today, um, where wells 6, 9, 11, 8A, 2021 are all combined into one system, one point of entry. That's where we are today. And we use well 6 as infrequently as possible. Right. So that So when you look at this, yeah, but, you know, it doesn't change our operating costs. It doesn't change the capital cost because that was built into another project. So there's co cost to it, but it's built into another project. Um, and so there's really no additional rate increase to do that. And if you look up there, and when you think about the um, regulated PFAS, as John Hurley, he just spoke about, we would be down around 19 parts per trillion. So well below all those standards. That's so the total four combined. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a little bit more there, so there's a little buffer in there. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, if you were to treat just well six, so this is just a bench scale testing scenario, just treat well six, um, which is the highest amount of PFAS right now, um, you could get it down to about 11 parts per trillion um, because wells um, 9 and 11 still have some PFAS, right? So you're basically reducing the concentration at six and you can get it down to 11. So that capital cost. The build of facility is estimated right now around $3.7 million, and the uh, annual operating cost is between $100,000 and $200,000. Um, so it's significant. It's a significant investment to go from 19 um, to 11. Um, and this is just looking at the, um, the four compounds, not total PFAS. Mm -hmm. So, and then if you were to say, you know, I want to have it be less than four parts per trillion, the maximum reportable level. Um, you know, that capital cost would add an additional $2.4 million to add some additional vessels to um, the treatment and some additional media. And this is where it gets a little tricky. Because we had breakthrough on the shorter chain carbons, those are not the ones New Hampshire has selected. That's not the four that's selected. So if you just want to treat for the four, which is what's whatever they're going to come up with, um, then these numbers where you see the annual operating cost between $0.6 million and 1.8 million per year have to do with whether you're going to try to treat all the PFAS or just the four PFAS compounds. <laughs> so it's a huge differential. Um, and I think, you know, one of our, uh, our focus points is here, that is still a very large range and a large rate increase. And really what you could be looking at is going from 19 to less than four um, from 0% based on this project, your rate increase up to 35%. And I think it's really important that we understand what we're getting for that. Um, as a community and as a water system. And as, uh, you know, EPA and New Hampshire DES works on the standards, I think that's one of the things that we need to follow. Um, we are recommending and we'll be moving forward with, um, hopefully, a, um, a pilot test. Um, one, one of the vendors has a pilot unit available for us to, to put in play, um, and we're hoping to get that up and running soon. Um, but we'll see with that and get that sorted out internally. So. This is the real high-level summary. I mean, there's lots of fancy numbers if you want to read them all. But uh, do you have any questions? Questions? <clears throat> well, I guess we have our town attorney here that has a question. Hey, Mark. Hi. How you doing? So as was explained this morning, in terms of the uh, rate increase, I, we know that Aquarian has made a pre-application for the drinking water trust fund grants that are available. Yes, we did. And uh, the deadline for that was June 15th for the pre-application, and I assume you'll be following up on that with whatever other steps are needed. 
Yeah, we, uh, we actually got notified today on um, the ranking, um, and we are going to be following up with them. Um, I don't always understand their criteria because it is a new criteria and a new process. Yeah. Um, we were on the lower side overall, so the chances of getting that funding this year it doesn't look that great, but I want to follow up and understand how they ranked each one. We got some points, and we didn't get, like, any water quality points, which is a little odd, but um, we aren't over a standard either, so maybe they view that in that regard. Um, so, yes, we did apply, um, and uh, we applied for a 50% grant because, you know, that's what was potential. So if we're going to do this project, why not? Um, so, And so to the extent that a grant is given, the percentages of rate increases that are reflected in the uh, the two bullets there, either under well six phase one or well six nine and eleven, would be cut, let's say in half if the full grant were given. I don't know if it would be in half because the, uh, your you know your yearly operating expenses have a pretty significant impact, especially if we're at one point eight million. But it would definitely have an impact, and sure. we could calculate that when and if we could get that grant, <laughs> which would be great. And I would suspect too that. Uh, uh, the rating system that's used may be affected if EPA, for instance, lowers the maximum contaminant level from from 70 down to uh, closer to the range where we're finding now in aquarium wells. Yeah, I mean, John Hurley, he talked about this. If you take New Jersey's standards and you add them all up, it gets back to 70, but they all have individual standards. Um, and um, right now, even we meet those New Jersey standards, so we'll have to see where the regulation ends up, um, and obviously we want to make sure things are, are done correctly. Um, so I mean, if we can get a grant and we need to treat, that's what we'll do. I think in, in the short term, um, you know, not knowing what we're trying to treat towards, you know, how much we're trying to treat um, from a toxicology standpoint that DES is higher than EPA is moving forward, it's hard to decide what to do. I'm sure on your side you're going, what, what should we think? Right. And we're kind of in the same situation. We, you know, we work towards the standards in which toxicologists come up with. It's really important that we, you know, we trust the, the work they're doing. So, And so uh, to the extent you're doing, say, the pilot uh, uh, installation, uh, that will get you even closer to being shovel-ready at the point where perhaps not in this cycle of grants but in a future cycle when things become clearer about what the acceptable level would be you'll be ready. Well, yes, it will get us closer. It'll also help us determine which media and what the operating cost is going to be more refined, which I think is really important. When you look at those ranges, that's not something I think as a customer I would accept, and as a company we cannot accept that range to say, hey, well, it might be 600000 it might be $1.8 That would just be um, impossible for either party to accept as an acceptable answer. So um, the pilot allows us to evaluate that from a media standpoint, the ion exchange was successful in a number, number of other sites, pilots in New Hampshire. We didn't see the same success in our bench scale, and we're not sure it's because of the water, water quality or because of the bench scale scenario. We actually used water from well six and spiked it at a higher concentration um, because you want to basically look at that um, so, you know, to see how it affects it. But it's still parts per trillion, so it's still really, really low. Um, I mean, one of the things we saw, some of the shorter chain carbons, um, would come attach themselves to the granular activated carbon, but, but loosely, and so they would loose, eventually get taken up and released again. So sometimes you had more um, total PFAS being released than was actually coming in because some would let go. Um, and that's pretty common with uh, GAC. So the, the shorter chains and what happens from a regulatory standpoint is going to drive the decision we make. So we'd like to understand it better through the pilot. Um, and just another source of funding to mention. Uh, besides ratepayers or grants, is that it, as uh, EPA or DES focus on potentially responsible parties for the mm -hmm. contamination that yeah. you've seen, wh whatever they are uh, forced to remediate could uh, reduce the cost that you're seeing there. Yeah, and as John Walsh has explained at previous meetings, we've been through that in a perchlorate issue um, in our Massachusetts system. We're familiar with it right now. We're following the lead of DES as they at least stopped it, as John Hurley he has said. Um, hope, we're hoping that um, I am hopeful that they'll remediate it and pull it back towards themselves yeah. um, and get rid of it so that 
you know, this doesn't uh, continue to escalate, which is one of the reasons we spiked the bench scale testing results. Yeah. So I was trying to, you know, simulate a little higher level um, and what would happen. So, yeah. Well, thank you for your proactive efforts. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, just one philosophical question, and, uh -oh. and I don't expect you to answer it right away, but, you know, you say, so I'm, so, so I'm, a, I'm a customer, and my rate increase is going to go from 14 to 35 percent. So I say Aquarian's a pretty uh, profitable company. You're doing well. How much are you eating, too? Or is it all being passed on to the rate of uh, the, the customer? Mm -hmm. The way that, our, the way that uh, we're regulated, uh, all the uh, Public Utilities Commission does when we go in for rate cases look at uh, two categories of costs, our expenses and uh, our investments in the infrastructure and they base our rates on those. Um, so if our expenses go up you know, 600000 per year, that event, that uh, the next rate case gets built into the, to the rates. Um, I don't know if that yeah, so, that, so you would, yeah, so you would, you know, the customers would absorb it. That's why I think, and Mark was, I think, alluding to this, um, if we're able to have someone, have an appropriate, responsible party, in our previous uh, perchlorate issue, that particular entity paid for the replacement of media over a certain period of time, so that, that our customers weren't paying for the replacement of that media. Um, so, and they built the facility as well. So, where we are on that is a long way right now, <laughs> but um, those are all options. Grants are options. Yeah. Obviously, we'll look to keep those. So, those are you know, <laughs> they look awful, but if we're able to get grants or or be able to get some of the responsible parties to um, mm -hmm. be responsible. That would be excellent. The other thing that um, uh, to recognize is that our Well 22 project, that well, uh, based on the testing, produces a lot of water and very high quality water. And one thing that we now have to look at uh, internally is what does that mean for, say, Well 6? Does Well 6 become a well that we just will never use? And uh, that is something we need to look at. I mean, if we don't need to use the well, then we're not going to build a, you know, almost four million dollar treatment plant to treat that water. That just wouldn't be a prudent uh, expense. Yeah, and, and the last piece of that is if we turn well six off and they don't do any recovery on their end, where's that water going? Is that just going to migrate further to nine and eleven? Is, is our concern. So yeah. we have a lot of vested interest. So ideally, you'd take well six off for a few years, let them remediate, right, and then have it be a viable well again at some point in the future. With, with bringing 22 online. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be the ideal scenario because that would be the least cost for us and the least cost to our customers. And all this is on your website? This PowerPoint will be on our website. It'll be on the website. Yeah. So if somebody wants to go, they can go to the, the aquarium website and see all the information and stuff? Yes. Carl's shaking his head, yes. <laughs> okay, super. Any other questions? All right, boys. Are we through with the slides because I have a couple of questions that aren't related. Here. Yes, we are. But I appreciate that. Uh, a couple of the things that we talked about this morning, I just want to confirm basically for the public. Uh, we did discuss hydrants and hydrant maintenance, and you are going to be keeping us posted, and we'll be communicating on that um, in our system. And also, um, anytime you uh, Aquarian is doing a project like replacing a line, replacing a joint, whatever. Uh, if it appears that there might be contaminants temporarily going into the water system that might show up in people's faucets, that you will get a little message out or something to warn people in their neighborhoods uh, that they might have uh, uh, water that doesn't look too nice and what they do about flushing their uh, home system so that they don't have dirty water. Absolutely, we will do that. We appreciate that. Okay, anybody else? Seeing none? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Was a lot of information. Close water. I always, and I always forget to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we have a stand that that should have gone uh, sure. on. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Just in case somebody. Yeah. I asked.
Thank you. in here to look for that stand. Oh, yeah, we'll find it. Got, it's Bunnings somewhere. It. Yeah. <clears throat> Next is the town manager's report. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, the emergency uh, sewer line along Route 101 has been installed. It is tested. It's ready to be uh, put into into uh, into service. Uh, the uh, operations are intended to make sure that we don't have an interruption in our services to the beach. Uh, and I'm sure Public Works will address that when they're talking here tonight. Please note that uh, the cost of purchase lots and cemeteries has increased to $701 per lot effective July 2nd of this year. The deliberative session for the special town meeting will be at 7 p.m. on Monday, August 6, 2018 in this room, the Selectman's Meeting Room at 100 Winnicott Road. Mr. Chairman, I had a note here from, <coughs> excuse me, from uh, New Hampton Beach. Uh, they wanted me to make the notation that they have again been selected as one of the top 10 uh, highest water quality uh, beaches in the United States, wow. which is pretty good. I also have a poll petition here. Um, and I'm bringing this up because it just came in and I know they probably don't have a couple of weeks to wait for this to get it effectively done. This is for 36 Fuller Acres. It's for a new underground service line, uh, but it's within the public street and the selectmen have to approve it. Of course, they'll be ta the utility company will be taxed for their portion in the street. I also have um, two liquor license requests that have come in. Um, one is for um, BGW LLC, which is Brittany Ward, mm -hmm. um, uh, for her new uh, pizza and pub uh, the, from the Division of Enforcement at 888 Lafayette Road. And the other one is for the Community Oven. Uh, for a restaurant, w wine, beverage, and liquor license mm -hmm. at 845 Lafayette Road. Mm -hmm. uh, I, they both need to be approved by the board so that we can signify that to the Liquor Commission. Do you want a motion now? Sure. I'll move to approve both. I'll second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Now, I'll just say that, that uh, Brit's pizza there is brand new, and I got a pizza there last night, and it's really good. So I'll give oh, her a applause. Oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, just be careful what, what the pizza the, um, is sitting on. Polar Acres is that the Medium. house that was taken down? No, this is another house. This is 36 Polar Acres. We need a motion for that. And we, what are they doing? They're they're instead of having the overhead line go into the house, they're cleaning up the, the new owners cleaning up the property. He wants to put an underground line in from the pole. So you've got to dig the, the edge of the street up, and he needs a permit for that. So that's not a new house? No, not to my knowledge, no. Any water there? Well, of course, there is water in the No, building. I mean, is it a really wet area? No, it's no. not. No. Okay. No, it's is dry. Is the name there? Um, yeah, it's done by Unitel, so uh, oh, okay. Fred Zollner, 36 Fuller Acres. Do you need a motion on that? I do need a motion because you have to look okay, over it. It's not going to cost us motion, anything. Right? Not cost, cost us anything. I think yeah. that is the house that came down. You think that's a yeah. new one? Okay, I don't know that. I haven't seen a building it's permit. It's behind the condos that are there. It's yeah. It's behind the other the other street. It's, on, it's off Cole Street, and the building has an address on Fuller Acres. Mm -hmm. So we have a motion to allow it. To move, all second. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Needs to be signed Thank by you. all board members. That's it, Mr. Chairman. That's it. Any questions for the town manager? Yes. Jim? And the intake. Rick? Mary Louise? Yes, I do. Um, this is to his report. Town office, your memo, well, Fred's memo on um, getting the town office area neatened up a little bit and fixing the sidewalks and whatever, I was certainly, I appreciated it. I'm glad to see proactive uh, in that because we don't want people injuring themselves on town property uh, either. So I thought that was a, uh, a good concept. Um, I also appreciated the um, notice uh, from Senator Shaheen who is really advocating quite, uh, quite well, she's doing a lot of work trying to get the harbor. Very vigorous. Vigorous, thank you. She's trying to get the harbor dredged again. Uh, but that is uh, great. We had a nice presentation somewhere in the pile that I got this morning on solar. 
I know that can be a sore point, but maybe it says utility scale solar is key to New England's energy future. If it's possible for us to use solar, even just for, say, police, fire station, whatever, uh, it's something that, that I think might be nice to look into. Um, 313 and 315 Ocean Boulevard, Green and Company's uh, new project. Okay, um, now this isn't the town yeah, manager. Yeah. 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 Well, none of it is. Oh. Just, that's a yeah. Okay, well, the business. town old business, business, the town business. office was. Okay, we'll take it up. Anything else on the town manager's report? Nope. Saying none, old business. First one we have is the signing of the special town meeting warrant. Yep. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> we have. Uh, drafted the warrant. Uh, the warrant calls for an appropriation by uh, bonding uh, of $4,937,868. That's for the new two new force mains uh, down church for the Church Street pumping station of the wastewater treatment plant down Route 101 and down uh, through the new lines that will be built uh, on uh, the side street running running in past the Masonic Lodge. Um, no tide mill. Right. Tide, tide mill is the street that will be located up, yeah. down to the plant. Uh, just so everybody understands, uh, the bond bank financing for this would be uh, seven million nine hundred and fifteen thousand one hundred and fifty-six dollars. That includes the bonding and the interest at three point eight six percent. The state SRF, which is the grant we're proposing to accept. Would be uh, six million four fifty four four uh, sixty eight. That's down from seven million nine to six million four, and your interest rate is down from three point eight six to two point four two, which is a substantial decrease over what we, we would be paying in the bond market. Uh, I did ask uh, the finance director to compute that out for us on the um, the SIRF funding for the state. Uh, it would be. 0 0.075 cents per thousand dollars valuation. That's down from the regular bond bank uh, funding, which would be 0 0.099 cents per thousand. So there's a, there's a 0 0.2 plus percent difference in the, in the funding and, and impact the tax rate. Um, this re requires a special town meeting. Uh, we have to advertise this in a, a newspaper general circulation, which will be done tomorrow if you sign it this evening. There is a lot of information in this. Um, SRF is allowed. Uh, we've provided for all the, uh, the bonding that's required under the statute. This will be for those two force mains, uh, and it will be for uh, to, the board has the opportunity to implement effective solutions if they should be presented before the system is done and incorporate that into the system. So every just about everything has been, I think everything's been thought of here. Um, mm. This would be, uh, the this, the town meeting would be um, the last Friday in August. Mm -hmm. It will be held over at the, uh, the elementary school and um, It'll be from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. because the statute requires us to be open for those hours. Mm -hmm. So we will be, if, if in fact that happens, we will be there. So and it will be at Marston? It will be Marston. at Marston. Marston School, Friday, August yeah. 24th. That's the only date that's available to us for the schools. Uh, that entire week they have special mm -hmm. classes and so forth for teachers. So the building's completely filled and uh, Friday is completely free. Good. School starts the following Tuesday, so Good. schedules get a little a little tight in here for these <laughs> things to be done. So, any questions of the special town meeting warrant? No. Jim, we've looked at all methods of funding. The SRF is the cheapest. Okay, cheapest. It's the cheapest method of funding for the the funds that we need to accomplish okay. the goal. And we've discussed. There were, there were some people talking about various other ways of funding, and you've looked into that? Well, there's been a request that we fund the entire thing from the, uh, the unreserved fund balance. Right. That's okay. Um, you heard the treasurer in here tonight looking for TANS. Yeah. Um, 
that would deplete our working capital or a very large portion of it. Uh, $5 million is not a small amount of money. Uh, that would leave us just barely enough to cover the unpaid property taxes that we have outstanding. Mm -hmm. That's much too close in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, it also means that many of the projects that we pass at town meeting will have to wait until taxes are paid before they can actually be done. Mm. Because right now we we revolve that money as our operating income and, and uh, we keep on revolving it from year to year to year. With interest rates going down on unpaid taxes, it's going to be much harder to accumulate dollars in that account. So we've looked at it. It's not recommended. Uh, we are about six or seven percent of our taxes are held, adjusted taxes are held in that account, and it goes up and down. We would, for instance, every year we've been committing a million dollars to decrease the tax rate. That would not happen if we did this. So there are, there are offsets to it. There are pros and cons to it. However, it's not in this appropriation request. It's not in the article <clears throat> because it's a different form of funding unless you instruct me to put it in the article. It can't be amended in the floor to take it from the unreserved fund balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make it clear that, that it had been looked into and well, we've discussed and everything. Debated this till probably yeah. all uh, of us uh, are sick and tired of hearing yeah. about that account. Yeah. Now I have another question. At the deliberative session. Yes, sir. How much can they change this? How, how much can this article be changed? It could be changed 10% up or it could be changed to zero. Okay. You can go down as far as you want, but you can only increase it by 10% yeah. of the statute. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Mayor no, Lewis? Thank you. No. All right. Need a motion? Yes, sir. We do. I have a motion. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. All right. There are four of these to sign, and there are two pages that require signatures uh, in each of the each of the and bindings. And you can oh, oh, thank you. you. We can start this one around. Yes. Okay. Give me a second here. You. Something that uh, I don't know if Public Works wants to say anything or no. no that's you. good. We're all, all set. pretty in the audience. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was a lot of hard work. Jen and Chris deserve a lot of credit. Yeah, there's a lot of work that went in. A lot this. of credit for that. I'm glad we had them here. Yes. We didn't. We'd be in trouble at this point. So, Sir. is there anything else under old business? Uh, yes. I'll sign those first, and then so we can get Give me a second around. here. Okay. Uh, I have a few things under old business. Um, first is the vote that we took on July 2nd to um, allow the town to put forth the grant that Experience Hampton uh, requested. Um, if we could just ask Fred to explain why that grant will not be applied for, because I think the public should know. Well, the board, Mr. Chairman, the board did vote to do that uh, a couple of meetings ago. Uh, we met with the financial people from Experience Hampton, tried to work out the mechanics that are involved with that. Um, given the amount of money that was supposedly there that needed to be raised, they needed uh, $2.8 million uh, to make the 20% threshold. They had committed to raise 1.3, and um, I think with some misunderstanding, and I'm going to call it that, uh, they thought they could use the 1.5 million that was voted to do the drainage and other things for the final improvements on Lafayette Road as um, towards as a credit towards the appropriation, hmm. uh, and that can't be done because no matter what you did, you, you'd still have to raise the 1.5 million to get the number of dollars required. So uh, that would boost the cost to be the 20 percent of the 2.8 million dollars total, and we we all felt at the meeting as we discussed this, that that would be virtually impossible by the time frame that was, that had to be, uh, this had to be implemented by. So we've kind of left it there. Uh, we've heard nothing back, uh, and I don't anticipate we will. Well, we have not heard anything back from that one way or another from them yet. That is correct. 
I, I had asked Fred whether uh, we would have to take another vote to say that we were not going to submit the grant, but apparently the financial uh, realities uh, preclude our having to do that. I think it'll just die. If okay. nothing happens, it'll just die. Okay. Um, On that matter, can we just go through? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not... Well, are not you, done yet? Well, you, you are you going to a different subject? Or are you no, the I'm same still subject? on this. Um, I will say that I respect John Tineos. He and his family have run an excellent business in this community, and I respect Dean Merrill. Uh, <laughs> when our former uh, insurance individual went out of business, my late husband and I took our auto and homeowners to Toby and Merrill. So I respect both individuals, but I will say that I think we need to be a little more careful here uh, as a board and individuals who have some connection, and, and Rusty, you do work for the chamber. That doesn't. That and has there, nothing to I, do I with think, the experience Hampton, by the way. I think, was, well. That has nothing to do with experience like Hampton. Anything like that, I think uh, you should end. If and you're going you to make allegations like that, come out and say it then. Both you and Jim have uh, family members who are on the board of experience Hampton that as well. That has nothing. And I just think we need to be no, careful about potential conflicts. There is conflicts. no conflicts at all there. Okay. Well, I thought I would just uh, express my uh, thought. Okay. Okay. I just like to say that uh, Experience Hampton brought forward a vision they had. Mm -hmm. It didn't cost us a penny to discuss it. Not one penny. Mm -hmm. We discussed it. There was a group that came in here and said we shouldn't discuss it. Other people on the board think we shouldn't even discuss it. It didn't cost us a penny to discuss it. I would encourage any group in town that wants to try to improve Hampton and yep. has an idea to bring the idea forward. Then, if it's going to cost money and we don't think that it's viable, then we can say that. Right. But discussion doesn't cost a penny, and it, it, it encourages people to keep going. The other thing on the, on the uh, conflict of interest, go back and look at the original Article 44 that experience Hampton brought forward. I was the only selectman who yeah, did yeah. not recommend it. I remember that. My yeah. wife being on a board has nothing to mm -hmm. do with what I vote here. There's no money being exchanged or anything. It has nothing to do with it. And I think it's absolute foolishness that somebody keeps bringing it up, probably uh, egged on by another group in town that doesn't want to do anything helpful, just wants to cut taxes. Thank you. Rick? I don't have anything to say. Thank you, neither do I. Anything else under old business, Mary no. Louise? Mm -hmm. Jim under old business. Oh, no, nothing. Rick under old business? Yeah, well, no, I just want to say, though, there's a second page to these things that oh, yes. signed. Okay. Oh, I didn't <laughs> and, uh, sign it. Yes, there are two I signs, two pages. I didn't sign the second page. Well, we'll get it back. We under new business? We're on, into new business. Okay. Um, I think that the time has come for us to sit down with the state of New Hampshire and discuss the ways to at the beach. We are the only community in the state of New Hampshire who has a state park where the state does not um, take care of the refuse generated from the park on its own property. I think we need to encourage the state of New Hampshire to have roll-offs on their property at the beach and to hire a private vendor and get rid of that. We're reaching a point in time now with this waste where the transfer station is either going to fall down or somebody's going to come forward asking for several million dollars to replace it. We've got to get control of the trash. And I'm going to ask for an overall discussion by this board in the next several weeks of the trash situation in, in, in its entirety. We are spending a huge amount of money and we, the, the waste keeps piling up and piling up and I think it is such a strain on the Public Works Department that we need to do something better, we need to do something smarter 
and uh, possibly turn the whole business over um, to outside vendors. So I am concerned about this trash. The other thing I'm concerned... Are you making that a motion? Um, I will so move that we sit down and discuss the disposal of state waste, which has been going through our transfer station for quite a number of years. So anybody in second? Seeing none, thank you. Well, that's, then it will continue to be a huge burden on the town. Um, uh, at the uh, bridge uh, committee, Fred and I were at the first bridge committee meeting last Thursday. Um, it does look like they are not going to be doing anything specific until 2023 or 2024. Um, they have, uh, they took a poll of some of our thoughts on the uh, <laughs> construction and what type of bridge it should be and what it should be named, etc. cetera. Um, so we will be meeting again in August and uh, it's nice to be taking a um, sampling of local residents, but uh, I'm concerned that the, uh, the cost is going to keep escalating. They say they have 42 million now. By 2023, God knows what the cost will be. No. Um, I just wanted to say, I just thought of it now. I should have probably mentioned it during public. Um, announcements that tomorrow is the second of those uh, seminars about the flooding mm -hmm. and I think tomorrow's the one about raising property mm -hmm. houses or something it's at the Masonic Hall mm -hmm. I believe it's six o'clock it's tomorrow the I think it is tomorrow yeah, yeah. definitely it's tomorrow yeah. I know that and I'll just back up with Rick said I went to the first one I know Rick yeah. was at it and they're very informative. They have a lot there. And I think they even provide a little supper. And so you could. Yeah. So it is, let's see. Yeah, it's definitely tomorrow night it's, at 6. It's July 17th. It's a second workshop. Yeah. Uh, options for protecting existing homes from coastal flooding. It's from 6 to 8 p.m. St. James Lodge, uh, 77 Tide Mill Road, Hampton. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, yes. one, one more. Um, w just to notify the public that the work has commenced on the Mill Pond Dam. So there might be a little difficulty getting through the end of uh, High Street while they're doing the construction. That was uh, new business. I'm a closing comments. Any closing comments? No. The only one I have is, is Mary Louise, you did send me an email on uh, Sunday in the middle of the afternoon. I did not see it until later Monday morning. However, I knew one was there because I received a, a text message from a certain reporter asking me about this email that was put out by you. And so I'm letting you know right now that I will not answer any of your emails because I don't know who or where they are going. And so if you send me an email, I do not plan on answering it. If you want an answer from me, I suggest you call me by phone or meet me at my house or something because I will not answer your emails because I don't know where they are going. What was the email? You uh, sent an email on uh, what was the gist 11, of the 7-8 about an emergency meeting of the board tomorrow. Oh, that was and because... When I, and when I get a call yeah. from a reporter yeah. Yeah. before I have a chance to read an email that is addressed just to me with a CC to the town manager, and I'm getting a call from a reporter stating that he has seen an email that, and he wants information on it. I will not be answering your emails. Thank you. Thank you. This two well, now we need a motion to go on to non-public. To make a motion that we go on non-public on the 91A, a, 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 cone 3, Roman 2, small a, and Roman small two, c. small a. And small c. And small, small c. c. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Uh, second? Okay. All those in favor, Aye. need a roll call? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much, Channel 22. Yeah, you like the light? Right. Thank That's you. Tom Sherman. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's running for the state senate, right? Yeah. Yes.